number two sense. See, you know, any of you guys, teachers ever used hornworms in a classroom? These are cute little worms with uh, 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 little horns. They're, they're about this big. Um, and they're often grown because they grow quickly, and so you could grow them in school and measure them, do stuff to them. And here are two sentences <laughs> uttered by children. One is hornworms sure vary a lot in how well they grow, and one is hornworm growth exhibits a significant amount of variation. Now, what I, as a linguist, what I'm going to tell you, and this is not written about much for teachers, although it's written a lot for researchers, is these are not in the same language. Right, just because we call it English, really any language has multiple sublanguages, which I call social languages. British linguists call them registers. One of these is the vernacular. The vernacular is the style of language you use when you're just being an everyday person. You're not talking like a specialist. Right? Which one's vernacular? Right? Everybody knows that, right? Uh, Nobody who learns English as a native language can fail to say one somewhere. They have different dialects, but I mean, that is, everybody can say it. How, what do you associate to hornworm growth exhibits a significant amount of variation? What do you associate that with? Science, term papers, term papers school. It's what I'm going to call a specialist variety of language. It sounds like, you're not, see, there's a test, a, a technical linguistic test. If you want to know what's vernacular or what's in a specialist language. This happens to be academic language, but I'm going to later show you there are other types of specialist language. But there's a definitive test for this. So it's easier to do it in Arizona where I live. You find the roughest bar in town, usually a biker bar. You go up and you speak your sentence, and if it's vernacular, the guy will be nice. If it's in the specialist language, he'll hit you. It always works. This type of language for many people is a bar. Many kids don't like it, right? Many of you probably don't like it. Which, which, if I, you have to take a book written one way or the other to the beach, which would you take? <laughs> hey, why is it a bummer? See, it's a, so, and the, so, well, before I, we get into why it's a bummer, let me tell you why it's even up here. If, if, uh oh. Oh, it does weird things. <laughs> All right, I need my guy back. Uh, the, uh, the, the, now I'm thinking of the bar. Um, <laughs> oh, the reason I'm telling you about hornworms exhibit a significant amount of variation is that uh, it, if that it, it's the inability to deal with that type of language that will eventually see to it that you don't get out of high school or don't get a call. Think about it. If that is your your high school biology book is written in that type of language, right? Your high school chemistry book is written in that type of language. It just disappeared. I guess when I stuck it on the board, it went away. Wow, all right. I gotta get out of New Media Lab. Um, the, um, so the, the thing is, think about it. Is your high school biology book is written in this academic language. If you can't read it, you're not going to college. Now, which it being that school is progressively more in that type of academic language, do you really want to get ready for it early, or do you want to get ready for it just when you see it? And you begin to see it about the fourth grade. You begin to get the beginnings of this more complex academic language about fourth grade. Now, have you ever heard of the fourth grade slump? Okay, the fourth grade slump is a very well-known phenomenon. No child left behind creates it with a vengeance. Kids pass a reading test by third grade, but can't read in fourth grade. Why? Because by fourth grade, they're seeing the beginnings of this academic language, and it's much harder than what they were doing. And if you're, so if you were, and I'm going to show you in a minute, that privileged families get their little kitties ready for this academic language, starting when they're five. Yep. You also talk to the tests. Yes. We also narrow the curriculum because yes. of all the pretty testing. That's right. We also have uh, a test that's unreliable and invalid. Right. But I think those are important to put out there. Yes, oh. I want to get to that. I, I, I'm going to get to the accountability regime. Yes. Well, there's been, in the Chicago area, for Spanish schools, there was a whole thing of IDS um, curricula and three different, at least for science, mm -hmm. three different colleges were developing a new curricula and they were trying to rewrite textbooks in 
what happened is their, we use this word, dumbed down textbooks, right. were still not okay. Yeah, that's so uh, a, a very, very stupid thing to do. And, yeah. uh, and because, of course, that's, you, look, the, 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 here's the, the brute argument. School starting in fourth grade is not in English, it's in Latin. Okay? So, and, and by the time it's high school or college, it's in really hard Latin. So if I dumb down the Latin early, you're just going to fail later. Now, when I say it's in Latin, I mean that quite literally, right? Because you know English has two vocabularies, a Germanic vocabulary and a Latin. But why does it have two vocabularies? Why have we got half Latin words and half German words? Because in 1066, the Normans, who spoke French, which is just bad Latin, uh, invaded England. England also had converted to the Catholic Church, which used Latin. So when English came back, so for years, the, the elites in England spoke French. But when English came back as a national language, a bunch of bilinguals put a bunch of Latin and French words in it. But the words are not evenly distributed in English. The Latin words tend to be in the book vocabulary. This is so true that if you, for example, if you, if you don't have the time to give somebody an IQ test, you can simply give them a 50-word vocabulary test but only put Latinate words on it and it will correlate with their IQ. Because IQ is basically verbal intelligence. It's how much you got book language. So the point is, in a real sense, in English, see, if you take those two sentences that used to exist on my slides, uh, uh, hornworm sure vary a lot is mainly Germanic words. But hornworm growth exhibits a significant amount of variation is mainly Latin words. Significant variation, growth, those are all Latinate terms. Yep. That's right. You, but if you start doing that whole baby talk or you know just talking down, yeah, to it, kids, it, baby talk's nicely emotionally involving, but the kids don't need it at all. No. I mean, they, they need the oohs and ahs and stuff. And the, you know. Yeah, they need enthusiasm. By the way, when you read, another very important variable is reading with a lot of intonation and right. uh, uh, interaction, you know, in your voice. That's very important. All right, let's get to that because you're. I lost my slide anyway. So. Um, <laughs> Because you're, you're, you're completely right. So what's happened in America, this has been going on for a long time, but it's become privileged families know how to accelerate their children before they go to school in a massive way. And we'll see later they use the digital technology to do this, but they also just use everyday language. Now there's a guy named Kevin Crowley who works in museums, and he has studied mothers and three-year-olds talking. And he has just talked about a phenomena that if any of you, any of you have a little kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a phenomena that it, you will know. Uh, and that is children's islands of expertise. This is where you all know one, the three-year-old is a little expert on dinosaurs. Right? Mm -hmm. Knows every dinosaur there is, or on castles, or on trains. Now these families, the first thing they do is they try to uh, get the kid to get a center of expertise. <clears throat> Then they accelerate it. You know, if it's Thomas the Tank Engine, they take him to train museums, they buy him trains, they take him to train stuff. And in that area, Kevin argues, when those parents now talk to the little three-year-old uh, in, in their area of expertise, they begin to talk in ways that are getting them ready for the specialist language they're going to hear in school. They're actually doing what I call informal teaching of language. And I'm going to show you one example. Uh, it is absolutely typical, and it, I want you to remember this is a three-year-old. He can't read at all. So the, the mother has a plastic egg and a card and a little plastic dinosaur. And the card tells you what the dinosaur is and about the egg, and, and, and the mother is interacting with the child over this, because he's a little expert at dinosaurs. So the child says of the plastic egg, this looks like this is an egg. And the mother says, oh, well, this, that's exactly what it is. How did you know? Now, what I want you to see, you as teachers will see this very clearly. This mother is teaching the kid to get ready for school. How, how is she doing it in that sentence? How do you know? I mean, that's a question you're going to hear in school, right? Then the kid says, because it looks like it. And the mother says, that's what it says. See, look, egg, egg, replica of a dinosaur egg from the oviraptor. 
What is she doing there? The kid says, well, I said it because it looks like. She won't accept the answer it looks like. What does she want? She wants the kid to appeal to print as the answer. He can't appeal to print. He doesn't read. But she's pointing egg, egg to the thing. She's saying print trumps what things look like. Now, by the way, in terms of our bar test, with replica of a dinosaur egg from the OB Raptor past the bar test for vernacular language. No, you get slapped in the face, right? Notice how she is going to vary vernacular language and specialist language. Why can she use the specialist language? Because she saw to it that he got a center of expertise, so he already has a lot of knowledge, so she can then tie the words to it. Um, okay? So the, the mother said, by the way, you'll notice the mother doesn't let the kid talk much. Uh, do you have, you have an Obi Raptor on your game, you know, the egg game on your computer. That's what it is, an Obi Raptor. Which move is she making here? Jurassic Park. What? Jurassic Park. Say it again. Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park, yeah. She is doing what linguists call intertextuality, but with that is she is linking the book to other books, other technology in the world. Shirley Heath already showed that the move of having kids link books to the world and to other books, these connections, is really crucial for getting a literacy mindset. So she is going to make these, she's trying to get the kid to think of all the connections of this activity to other books and to other technologies. Um, and this is the hind claw. What's the hind claw? Pause, little wait time, right? And then the mother answers the question, a claw from the back leg from a Raptor. And you know what? So here she's. She's doing modeling of how you answer the question. She doesn't even let the kid answer the question. Right? I didn't say this was uplifting. I just said it was good for school. Um, the kid says, he finally gets his dog, hey, hey, a velodraptor. I had that one on something, probably another game. And the mother says, I know, I know. And that was the one. And remember, they have those. Remember, in your book, it said something about the claws. So another connection to another book. And no, I know that kid tries to talk again. Who cares? The, your dinosaur <laughs> book, what they use them, and the kid says, have so great claws so they can eat and kill. And the mother says, they use their claws to cut open their prey. This is a move that many people have studied in school. Oh, damn it. Oh, I'm so in. Catch the slide. OK. But see, it might have just went away. Oh, no. No, I'm just kidding. Come on. Do it. I touched it. Go to the slideshow. Oh, should I go to slideshow? No, no. Here comes the, here comes the. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't use it. Okay, thank you. I'm never going to touch him again. I guarantee I will not touch the screen again. Well, if I did, that's okay. Um, this, oh, here we go. Oh, um, this idea, they have so great a clause so they can eat and kill, they use their claws to cut open the prey, is called revoicing. Teachers often take what a kid says and revoice it in a way that models a certain form of language. Right? So notice she takes his vernacular thing and puts it into a less vernacular form. Um, now, I just put this up to say what Crowley found is that this is the way mothers talk to their three-year-old when they are talking in an area of expertise. But if the child asks a question in an area where they do not have an island of expertise, they don't talk this way. So when the, this uh, first kid was an expert in train, so he says, well, he's saying that he saw some steam coming out of a kettle. This is like my train. And then the mother gives a whole explanation <coughs> about steam. By the way, Crowley also shows the explanations are always wrong. It, but it doesn't matter, because this is a language lesson. It's not about knowledge, per se. It's about language. But when the kid asks, so here's a kid asking about football. The kid doesn't know anything about it. He's not a little expert in football. So when he says, why did that knock that guy down? The mother says, because that's just what you do when you play football. See, they only do it islands of expertise because that's only where they can marry specialist language to what the kid knows. Um, 